welcome everyone to the TST Roundtable of October 18th. And uh, before we go any further, um, I'll say who I am. I'm G. Truly, the founder of TST. And we have some other people here that will introduce themselves. But I want to remind you, next Thursday night, we will be doing a TST scan tool shootout. We're going to be doing it on a BMW, a car that you most likely would have come in your shop if you work on European cars. We're going to baseline it with a factory tool and use other tools. So uh, we have a whole bunch of different scan tools to use. We don't read directions. We're just going to plug it in. It better be intuitive enough like we've done in the past. And we're going to grade it on PID count, how many modules, coding, reprogramming, bi-directional control, and some other stuff. So make sure you tune in and don't forget our YouTube channel, uh, TST Seminars uh, on YouTube. Go to YouTube first and type that in. Anyway, so with that being said, tonight we have a whole bunch of stuff we're going to go over. We're going to be talking about seasonal services, cooling and heating problems, training. We're going to be talking about the New Orleans Car Show, the big TST uh, event out in Ontario, California, and some upcoming stuff coming out there, direct injection and uh, deposits with direct injection, and much, much more. Um, even this new launch lab scope here. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well. So with that being said, uh, let me introduce Pierre Rispo here. He's the Vice President of TSD. You can introduce him. Okay. okay, and this is Rich Peterson. Oh, he, he's a board member. I guess we'll go around the table that way. And that way you really don't know who we are. <laughs> All right. right, you always think it's the other guy. <laughs> We're introducing ourselves, are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're going to introduce yourself. All right. uh, Basil all right. Stratos, treasurer of New Jersey. Right? No, he is. He only lives in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> He's here in New York for whatever reason. No. I'm Alex Portillo, and I work at Car Clinic. And he's my boss. I'm Craig Portillo. I kind of bastardized the pronunciation of my last name. And I'm Bear. Associate member of TST. Uh, Eric Dibner, associate as well for TST. And you know, we should say uh, Craig is the assistant technical editor of PTAP. I'm the full technical editor and regular assistant. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow, are you really? And by the way, you're looking at some of the guys here. I write, I have an upcoming article. Perhaps you've seen the article uh, in August. Oh, and by the way, in Alex Motor is H. a columnist now for yes, Auto Service Pro. Yes, and Alex, Pro. what's the name of that company? Auto, Auto Service Pro. Auto Service Pro. So what? read some articles uh, of Alex's <laughs> articles there. But with that being said, the reason why we say that, we also have a TST column every month in uh, Motor Age. And if you'd like to send information in with your pictures, your name, and everything, so you get the credit. We will put you on our TST column in Motor H, so you'll be published, per se. If you suck at writing, that's okay. Uh, we will take your bullet point stuff. We need year, make, model, car, problem, and so on. And we'll make sure we'll put it in there, as well as our TST newsletter. So uh, any and all help is good. And knock is behind the camera. Knock if we have any questions or comments. Just please yell them out. Yeah. Okay. So with that being said, let's open this up with... Uh, Hey Alex, why don't you go first with uh, some cooling and heating problems that heating you problems. Uh, you can't Head gasket. No, I had a heating problem. Craig, heating uh, problem. Obviously, check for cooling. You don't want to have any leaks. Um, after that, you know, if, if you do have cooling, you want to start the car up, and later on, make sure your thermostat's opening. At, at, the, at the right time. Well, have you come across a lot of cars that are low on yes. freeze or coolant? Yes. I just had a Honda Civic 2002 1.7. It was low on cooling, no heat. It was, the problem was that it had air in it. Air is a big thing. So what do you do in your shop for taking air out? You know, the bleed is on a lot of these cars are <laughs> scary. <laughs> some, of them, or some of them don't have them. And some don't have, and then you got to burp the hose. Yeah. And they got high and low spots in the system. It's like, Absolutely. you know, whoever figured that plumbing out, it, well, it used think to, of gravity. It used right. to be the radiator was the highest part in the yeah, system, right? right? It's not true anymore. It used to be. But yeah. that's not true. So sometimes so, you got to really burp them out. So what I will do is I will take our, we have we have two systems here. We have the, the gel phone that everybody knows, or we have the, 
the I forget the name of airlift. The airlift. 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 Yeah, but that's that's not too good when you have a lot of cooling on the system. So I put the the funnel and I just let it let it run, <laughs> and you know push the hose to make sure there's any air pockets, you know to push them out. And after that, uh, if you have heat again, then you did your job. But you need to find out why it was a low on cooling. Well, this is this brings up a dangerous game that sometimes you can play. Um, I'm not a big fan of the funnel, especially on these cars. Air pockets don't come up right away. Right. I think a lot of you agree with me. Right. It can be hidden for a while, and we're talking about hundreds of miles. They will not come out. Um, air lift, if you get everything out and you yes. suction it down, right. is a way better way of going, but you need your engine coolant or antifreeze pre-mix the right one obviously right to go in the car and make sure the system is totally sealed right that is that is the thing to do now the other thing that you have in your shop is um from uh not norco the other flow company, dynamics flow dynamics which is a whole cooling system machine that i've yeah. seen you guys use many yeah. times when you're doing a complete flush which puts it into the vacuum automatically right and transfers the fluid because nowadays with engines so expensive, an air bubble could cost you a cylinder head or an engine. Yeah. And these are very expensive. Yeah. So inexpensive thing is pretty good as airlift is probably about a hundred dollar tool on the street. Yeah, that's it's not, great. It's now, not bad. Now with the with the airlift, do you have to is the system gotta be dry? Or if you have to be down to a certain level. Yeah, you gotta be down to a low level. Oh, okay. You really have to have it low. Yeah. Like, you gotta have it low and you really good. gotta get your shop air in there and yeah, it's like I, I, I use it. I'm sorry, I use it when I do timing belts because as soon as I take the water pump off, you, you're, you're low enough. Yeah. I'm low enough. Okay, you, you don't if have I to do be a radiator, dry, it's just got to be Yes, if heavy I do low. a radiator, if I do a hose thermostat, I use the funnel. Okay. It's just, and I have good luck with it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you haven't drained all the coolant out of all the stuff in the back of exactly. the side of the motor. Still cool but you never know if someone's low if he drains back. That's the point right. I want to make here. Yeah, right. exactly. You know, yeah. The, funnel, the funnel could work successfully, no doubt. I've used it in the past myself. But I'm just leery when motors are so expensive mm -hmm. to use it, and especially that how many cars are really low on coolant already. Mm -hmm. These people yeah. don't open their hood up. No. This no. is not a service station where you got gas and they checked under the hood. Right. This is a day when they bring it into you. We were talking about this earlier. You know, the 3,000 mile or the 5,000 mile or 7,500 oil 10, change. You got to really make sure you check everything. Why? You may not see these people for another year or so. Yeah. And if something Dependent. breaks a month down the road, they're going to somehow hold your, you accountable for the fact that you didn't find it, even though they only came in for an oil change. Correct. Yep. So anything else, Alex, on it? You know, heating or any other problems? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I got the car to get heat again, but the problem was that it had a bad head gasket. Um, which, Tons of air. <laughs> yeah, that's why I call that clean. air. Yeah, <laughs> you had a bad head gasket. You had double the head gasket, the fans weren't coming on. Wow. So I diagnosed the fan issue, but it still had a head gasket problem. What yeah. kind of car? It's a Honda Civic okay. 1.7, and but eventually it's gonna lose heat again. Oh no! Yeah. Doubt. And so what what and fixed the fans? Uh, what fixed the fan was the the fan switch. Um, it wasn't it wasn't turning the fans on. So the way I figured it out was pretty simple. You make sure that you you, did, you just disconnect the switch um, off the sensor and you just jump it and see if the fans come on. Good. Now, what sensor? Tell everyone. Uh, what sensor? Coolant sensor? Or fan no, sensor? it wasn't the coolant sensor for the computer. It has, it has this Honda Civic has two different sensors. It has a, a, a sensor for the computer and a sensor just for the fan system. The fan system is attached next to the thermostat housing, and that was the sensor that was. Now, this is still a sensor with a, you know five volts or whatever reference computer input, or it's is a this a switch? Type it's a twelve volt. volt. It's a twelve volt switch. Thermal, from a, thermal switch. Thermal switch. Thermal switch, okay. and it's powered up by a relay. Okay. What's the PID for it? If you're looking no at PID at that There's no point. PID on that. No PID. PID. That's a yeah. straight mechanic, uh, electrical system. And okay. you see what happens there when the fans don't come on. You, you don't know. You overheat it. Now you need that gas. And you don't know it. Yeah. It's not turning a light on or anything until it's already yeah. cooking. What so year? What year was that? 2002. If it was a 2002 Honda, I'm sure the fan. It's that's probably an, an emergency switch. That switch. Uh, I got that car over 220 degrees Fahrenheit, right, and right. the fan did not want to come on. Mm -hmm. Even with wow. the sensor for the computer, that the computer knew that it was that hot. Yeah. 
Because wow. usually they, yeah. they're still controlled by the PCM. That's what I figured. Right? That's what they I have a, too. an override I when it gets over yeah. so many degrees. degrees. So 220 is pretty high. Yeah. Apparently, yeah. since it needs a head gasket, something it's wasn't fucking a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's it brings us to making sure preventative maintenance is done and making sure fans come on. And by the way, circulation. Check circulation. A lot of people don't check circulation very well. Water pumps, with, you know, BMW land, Volkswagen had them too. These plastic impellers, yeah. regular yeah. income that's what is I'd, the way I look at this. That's what I'd like to ask. Is anyone familiar with, I mean, I know even on flow, they've been NASCAR and stuff, they've gone away from water temp and gone to pressure and flow. Has anyone seen, uh, you know, with a clear hosing or any kind of system where you can observe the flow? Yeah, I've, I've always, uh, when I've I was always, I haven't. Yeah. Seen a lot of them. I've heard different ones mentioned. I don't know if anyone's. I've seen, seen them. That I don't know what them. I didn't have it, uh, anything I bought when I was at VW. You know where I was the guy figuring out how to fix stuff and mm -hmm. showing the guys they, in the shop. I I had the parts department supply me with a, a a little auxiliary water pump and some clear uh, tubing, mm -hmm. and we would put them in for the. Now we were looking at heater uh, core blockage issues. Right. So we put them in the heater uh, hose and see, A, if you had circulation without the pump running, just hose, yeah. and, uh, and without the pump even in the system. Oh, but don't on, you its own. on its own. And then uh, would put the pump into it and augment flow and see if the heater worked because there were two problems. One was a flow issue, no, sometimes the water, issue. and the other one was a restriction. And, but the restriction is tricky on some of those because there's a bypass on the heater core. So the core can be plugged. But you can still have flow, but it's not going, going through, through the core. core. Right. It's going in and out yeah. without actually going through the heat exchanger yeah, part. It's like that. So if you had if you had good flow and no heat, it was plugged, and we never succeeded in flushing those. Yeah. Things. Repair was by replacement. Mm -hmm. They do have a. I will say that I've run into a problem on certain General Motors vehicles where the flow through the heater core opens up the thermostat and if you have a blockage in the heater core flow the thermostat doesn't, work. The thermostat doesn't open any engine overheats what year man it's one way to make sure you always have a good heater core uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for sure uh, what year and and what model year range, uh, I, I can't tell you that i know i've diagnosed a couple of them because they said that the fan wasn't coming on, and it ha actually happened to be because there was no. That's was it a roundabout way to talk about it? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. So sort of Were you able to? Did you ever try the FLIR tool on that? Yes. And does it work? Yes. Oh, it's good. See, yes. I was going to say, how did you diagnose that? You're an electrical guy. I, di I diagnosed that with, with the FLIR. With the, with the, the FLIR, FLIR tool. Thermal imaging. That's right. Thermal imaging, the way to go. What's hot and what's not. Cool. That's right. Yeah. Very good. That's good. So anything else, Alex, on you haven't used that yet, right? Um, <laughs> no, just you know, keep an eye on the coolant. Um, also, I think that uh, if you're ever if you're doing thermostats, I mean, if you're doing water pumps or any any sort of coolant work, you, you know, recommend changing the thermostat because you know yes. the flow of the water pump might be different. So just keep that in mind. That way, you don't have any heating problems in the future, and you know. Keep and, up with your cooling the, flushes. The other thing is look at time to climb. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a code yet, mm -hmm. but make sure that the engine's warming up quickly enough. Oh, because so if open. not, right, it could be bleed. The thermostat can be bleeding. Mm -hmm. I'll call it right. Right. seeping, leaking Seep, a little right. bit, and it takes too long to climb. It may not have set a code yet. It could be a mode six issue. It could right. prevent monitors from yeah. running. It prevent yeah. monitors. And if you had the Bernie tool. The Bernie E scan, it'll, tell, tell, it'll you tell you the time right on. Right. Right. Um, so very important. Well, you can graph it out if you don't have an E scan. You could take your scan tool and take the temperature pin and graph it. And if it takes too long and you're using the correct thermostat, a 190 to 195 range, 192, 195, then that's the right one for the vehicle. A lot of problems that people have with these thermostats is exactly what Pierre was saying. Now another another test, you put a scan tool on it and go down the highway, or you could probably rev it in the bay, but I like to have airflow through the radiator. And the faster you go, the colder it gets, that thermostat's weak. Yes. It's gotta go. Well I'd like to add too, you probably know Pierre that uh, especially with the VWs, 
it's OE on the thermostat. I've seen yeah. it. And on the temp sensors. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of and, problems. And, and not across the board with aftermarket brands, not any one specific. And, and on the temp sensors, you have to be careful of the integrity of the plugs. Those little connectors are, are weak. Mm -hmm. And it was very common for us to uh, change. And, oh, by the way, they want no more on a cold engine. They want no more than two degrees centigrade between the the two sensors. Intake air and in, right in and out air. Uh, some cool. Toyotas cool. are seven, some cars are ten, some are five. So it depends. You should always see when a car is stone cold between coolant CTS and IAT, and some cars BTS. But this battery. Not this was actually two, two coolant, coolant sensors. sensors. Yeah. This was the in and out coolant sensors. Right. Wow. But they're also looking but, and they're looking at air temp too. They're looking at air temp because right. there's a delta between. To and see both, how yeah. far one goes and if the other one doesn't and go. We found changing one sensor never worked for us. We had to change both sensors at the same time. They were it was too close. And we a lot of times had to repin the connectors with those little gold plated voltage drops. Yeah. yeah, voltage just a little bit in, uh, you know of a, of a drop uh, across the pins. Mm -hmm. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, if you're working with um, electronic climate control, just keep in mind. Pierre probably knows this. Uh, Recalibrations on those systems is very important. Uh, I fixed the four Taurus by just doing a recalibration because at some point it, the module lost its memory and the flapper was an opening. Oh, the motors are in the wrong position. So they either, don't know where the rims are. Either you have a bad flap, uh, a, yes. a flapper motor that might be jammed. Initialization. Or or it just happens to lose its mind. I so v VW has this problem yeah. too. You, you have to initialize. Temp, uh, a blend door, climate blend control, and the climate blend door. It's more than blend. It's more than blend door. But it's all the doors. They go. It's door. all the doors. Right. 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 Some of them, like Chrysler, uses right. full electronic, no yes. vacuum. Right. right. Ford right. mixes them, so does GM yeah. sometimes. Right. Exactly. You go stop to stop. Right. It has to know if it's in the middle. Right. It's at the close right. end. Right. Because otherwise it gets confused. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it tries to initiate a command and it gets the wrong result. It's important to state, and Alex is alluding to this, and another car he diagnosed is Saab. Um, it had the same issue where the air conditioning would never come on. Mm -hmm. And it's the recalibration, it would like work for a year, and then it worked for a few months, and then it like worked for a few <laughs> weeks. Yes. And yeah. they're like, okay, and we diagnose because there's a TSB, it has to do with um, a flapper the motor, motor being bad. And, and then it breaks off the flapper motor on the driver's side. Uh, so if you stick your head, if you take the covers off, it's a little bit of a pain, but if you take the covers off, you can see, I, I found it on after I took the cover off on, on the cover itself. Sitting, uh, sitting on the cover. And then I fixed the problem and it didn't work until I recalibrated it again. Right. So, so you fixed the broken part, Yes. Right. but it needed to be calibrated. Yeah. So the reason I bring that up is to use caution if you do fix a car that way, uh, recalibrating to warn the customer that there might be a reason why the computer lost its mind. You know, yeah. start simple, start the recalibration, and, and see. And I don't know goes. about other brands, but with BMW, there were a couple of models. This is a while ago now, where the the motor had too much torque, and it would actually snap the plastic pedestal that held the motor, and the motor was moving, but it wasn't right. moving the flapper. It wasn't right. moving it enough because it was flopping around in there, you know, as it was exercising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's ask if there's any questions, Knox. Any questions or comments? We have two questions. Okay. The first one is who makes the airlift? The yeah, second question. Uh, U-View. Oh, it, uh -huh. U-View, you can get it. U-View um, sells their stuff all over. And Mac Tools, um, Snap-On. They sell it through Mac Tools, Maco, Snap-On, everyone. And Snap-On has a version as well, but um, you decide which one you want to buy. U-View, they're uh, some of our sponsors, so um, Phil Trigiani and Tony Ferrara, they make some good stuff there. So, so Italian question. dudes make this tool. <laughs> Canadian Italians. The second question, how do you check coolant freeze or boiling point and uh, the additives in it? Okay, well, uh, freezing, boiling, I don't like to use a hygrometer. I like to use the, uh, refractometer. the refractometer, refractometer. Way to go. which is a, uh, it's a, mine's made by Leica, I think, but there's a bunch of companies that make them nowadays. Right. Including Malibro. There you go. You put a dab on this thing and it basically, based on the spectrum of the coolant, mm -hmm. and you shine it up and you look at it through a, at a light, bright light, and it, and it gets, there's a, a light dark line 
at a marker, you know, there's a grid on the side of it, and depending on what coolant you're using, or battery acid even right. works work. on yeah. it, uh, yeah. it'll tell you, you read that grid, and it tells you what the value is. Specific gra gravity for acid, boiling point, or, or freezing right. point. Yeah. And, for, and um, the question coolant. here was, what do you use? That's way better than these little bubble ball things that are not really accurate. A real yeah, the fractometer is the way they're, to go. They're doing I, specific I use, gravity, but spe that's... I use the strips. That's for additives that's and for... That's, right. that's, 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 that's the other half of the that's question, actually. But well, they also check boiling, boiling point, freezing point. Mixture, you know, concentration. I've always, you know, I, I guess I was too yeah. cheap to buy the strips. Yeah, I, just, I, I don't think know. it works forever, you know. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure on that technology, right. um, but I would go with a refractometer when we were at Prestone. That was something. In fact, we got to get the Prestone guys on one night. They're not far from us uh, now. What, what, and, uh, what do you use for water with your coolant when you mix uh, it up? Now that's oh, a big. Yeah. It comes water. out of a hose. It comes out. Of <laughs> <laughs> mine came out of a. Mine was distilled. Distilled water bottle. <laughs> By the way, and, do you uh, realize that's why a lot of these companies now sell wow. pre-mix yeah. engine antifreeze coolant? Right. I because of. The they, hard water, the chemicals, they never, yeah, chlorine. You never, yeah. We have like really yeah. bad water here, I have to admit. It's purely cheapness, and customers not wanting me to pay to put distilled water in it. Well, my customers uh, just, that was the price. I'm well, sorry. Was, we I never, we never right have way. problems, and we actually have to post signs in the shop that says, do not drink the water, it comes out of the sink. So, mm -hmm. but it, well, it's working. What I found, of course, it was I was a BMW specialty shop, and I had same customers for decades. What I found was these engines went for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles, and if I eventually had to take a head off or something, it looked like brand new. I never had. It was a buildup. There was no buildup. There was no uh, erosion. erosion. There was no pH uh, etching of metal. Um, there were, I never had issues with that, and I found that all the components of the system lasted longer. I used OE water pumps and OE. You know, I was, right. So you weren't getting impellers being eaten up. None of that. Pin, Never, no, last freeze out plugs going. This is sometimes with water. Seriously, I learned a lot going over uh, to the Prestone group as well as the Fram group. Um, and they're all part of the same company, Airtex and Wells. Um, they really said a lot of people don't know, number one, how much water to add, right. the quality of the water they're putting right. in. So premix in many cases, if you flush the system out totally, get all the water out, mm -hmm. that's probably the best way of going. Also, yeah. well, I know, I know, and you know, if fifty-fifty is good, and, and we're eyeballing myself included off the top of the thing. Well, and if you're adding it to it, and you don't know it's in there. Well, seventy-thirty is probably better. No, it's not. <laughs> no, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, know that's, that. I know yeah, that's, that's the, the point, point he's bringing up. That's the psychology, but yes. it's not. No, you guys I, out there, I, it's not bad. I know that. The, the healthy <laughs> range, I think, is fifty-fifty to sixty-forty, right? Yeah, that's it, like it, the range that's and, acceptable. It, it all depends, obviously, where you live. You know, some spots yeah. need that point a little bit different. Right, right. right. Um, inspect your inspect when you take apart. It tells you the big story. I mean, <laughs> if, if you have cavitation marks, you have impeller issues. Think about it. Obviously, it can be the water. It can be uh, a part that went through it. But the cavitation marks are usually hard water. Yeah, Here and that, and that's a big problem out there. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. Not. Are there any questions or comments based on that? No, that's it. Okay. I got something to say real quick. Sure. Like what you were saying about the blend doors. I just spent 15 hours on an 08 Ford F550 Mason dump. Yeah. And all the new Fords, oh, I have pictures, which is going to be an article. All the new Fords have this, I know, <laughs> have this little tray on the top of the dashboard. We pulled out $9 in change, six pieces of gum, a 3 8 bolt, two sets of keys. I think pictures. The I have all the pictures. One truck. One truck. But it got to the point where... At first, we, I thought it was just a set of keys. I used uh, a bore scope with uh, the mechanic's fingers taped to it, and I was pulling stuff out. The way it's designed, you can't get into the end, pull the dash. Yeah. Just walk the dash back six inches, eight bolts, the cover comes off. But it was a 15-hour learning process, and the motors actually have a limiting switch on them, so they didn't break, thank God. But wow. we were still talking to a $1,200 job. That's your clue. Just to clean it out. Just to clean it out. Yeah. Wow. The pile of stuff. That's a common like problem. Thing. They put stuff on the desk. They uh, all well, slide in there. Well, it's a construction thing. vehicle. It's not right. the guy. But they're asking. I mean, if you put a notebook, you're fine. And but the vent itself, the space between them has yeah, got to be a good inch and a half. To fit now. a three eighths bolt yeah. with a nut on it and just drop right down wow. is unbelievable. Wow. And if they only had a little bit, or even a piece of foam or mesh, that would take care of the problem. Yeah. 
but every cust every every one of us has a customer that's either a landscaper, contractor, or something. Right. Just tell them don't put anything on the dash because the dealer will no matter what warranty you have, if there's anything in the blend door, warranty's void. Void. And they get fifteen hundred in Jersey to do that job. Wow. It's big. Now that I know how to do it, it's not as bad. But how many of us want to pull dashboards? No freaking right. I mean, never like the, the learning curve in this business is amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But who, the stuff who we have the gum. <laughs> I was baked. Oh, <laughs> the stuff. Actually, okay. found the, the back end of a pepper too. Let's uh, let's change <laughs> up the. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'll show you the pictures later. Please. Let's change up the subject and uh, go to. Not maybe you can zoom in a little bit on us. And by the way, as, when, uh, as Nock is doing that, th they had this out in California, so we got to play with it a little bit while it was on the on the table there. And the scope box, brand new. Pretty neat. Just came yeah. out. The scope box is brand new, is out. They also have a sensor simulator right. we're waiting for, mm -hmm. which is really neat. And this is a four-channel scope. So it's a four-channel scope. Uh, they say the isolated grounds. Metal B and C. I haven't seen that in a while. Everyone's yeah. been using plastic. Right. Metal B and C. That's pretty, uh, pretty good. Yeah, Connects rugged. to this box here by a USB cable, and you can see the picture. I just took this off the Bernie board behind us. You know, not hard. Of course, I didn't read the directions. <laughs> I just went into it. I could turn channels off and on and all that. Uh, one thing here: the ranges are pretty easy. Or to put stuff on and off. It's a nice picture, too. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty nice yeah. picture. And by the way, that is it. And by the way, this yeah, this tool is really the GBS, which is a scan tool and all that. I could put this thing online, so I can go to the internet. I got here Internet Explorer. They have a deal now with All Data, probably the best supplier of aftermarket information out there. I I happen to really like it. You have uh, oscilloscope, ignition, sensor, and multimeter. Uh, all here, you can do email on it, the whole bit. So it's pretty nice. No moving parts. It's the nice hard stuff. drive is solid state. Yeah, yeah, it's all solid state. So, you know, Nothing. I'm not going to say drop it, but, you know, it, it might happen in a it's, shop, right? It's rugged. The, the only question I would have for launch, I like this, but the only thing I find, I wish they had a handle on the other side of it. Yeah. You know, I wish there I was could two, see that two wish, handles here. I wish the scope box would dock into the that thing so that you're having them all around like this. Um, cool. I'm not sure. I didn't read that part. I think the only way that I know of right now is this gets powered up, and there's the USB here. Okay, mm -hmm. but it would be nice if they if were if it snapped together. Dockable. Either that or dockable, whatever. But I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. He just got this in. So uh, it's, it's a time very time. neat tool, and by the way, on our scan tool shootout, we will be using the GDS. I really like right. the uh, the new update process that we're showing Al uh, Alex. You're really super easy. Just plug it into the internet, and you're pretty much done. You got a printer on the bottom of this thing, so it prints out. You got a couple of USBs. The man, a couple of dates. You have uh, <laughs> internet connection here, and you can put it to a big monitor. If I was running this in a shop, I'd get myself a nice monitor at wherever you want to buy one, put it on there, and now everything's on your big monitor. They made that for all the trainers in the world, teach people how to use launch. Exactly. I'll tell you what, I own one of the schools, <laughs> it's one of the best investments they made. Really this, this is uh, something that, it does a lot of cars. Four air. What? Which particular vehicles I do you have? I everything, it? it's so fast. Very it's good it's on domestics very, now. Yeah, everything. In fact, when I was speaking to tech support, Sam, He's one of the guys that comes out to Las Vegas. I'll introduce Craig to him, uh, along with Holland and Victor. Um, they really have some neat stuff, and they're really getting up to date on all of the updates. The updates, you can go on every day. They may have an update. Yeah, it's and it's really easy to do. It's yeah, not a hard setup. You hit update button, it updates. You know, before it was a bit of a process. Super hard. And they've made it like what, a one click thing now? Yeah, it's one click and it's on. And from here, this is real easy. I mean, you go on your wireless. It's like you the go Pegasus, on, right? It's just one button. And so yeah. that's another tool. Okay. Yeah, before it was you had to pick stuff. It was, yeah, it was a little harder. So they got some neat stuff. And if you're interested, you'll see this in the uh, scan tool shootout. We're still waiting from our uh, friends from Autel 
to send the unit in. Uh, we'd like to put the Autel in the scan tool shootout, because I do get a lot of questions. You have one that we can put in? We're going to let him bring his. We don't know what it'll do. I do have a story on the Autel. How new is the um, software on that? Here's one of the problems. A guy was using it with Ford, and he connected to a Ford. In fact, uh, this is a big, a big company out there. Craig knows the guy, and I know the guy. He was on one of the beta groups. And he's really into scan tools because he does all tech support. And he gets this call from one of his stores that the uh, car has certain problems that the Autel identified on a Ford. Works just like the IDS, power balance work, the whole bit. And uh, he said, okay, I'm trying to hook on, but I can't connect to your tool. They use the Ford IDS, okay? So the guy goes, well, we're not using the IDS. We're using, the tech is using his Autel. He goes, well, we can't connect to the Autel. Put your IDS on there. Well, they found out the problem with this car was, yeah, it had a couple of codes and some issues, but it needed to be reflashed. Once they reflashed it, the Autel did not work on that car anymore. Really? Nothing. Couldn't get, couldn't communicate. I've had issues with communication issues. Communication so issues. this is something to be wary of out there. And these guys got a brand new J-Box out, Launch. Launch nice. has a brand new J-Box, and it's by the best people, TrueTech. But so they are going. What's the bonus? The 20 bon pin BMW connector. So you can use it the BMW factory tool. Yeah, so you can um, use it with the BMW factory good. tool. And where I, when I was in Philly, they were selling them for eleven fifty. dollars um, J-Box? Yeah, and I said, and I asked the guy, I said, are you sure that's correct? Because that's an insane deal. I mean, you can't buy them from Drew Tech that yeah. cheap, and Drew Tech's who makes the thing. Yes, Drew Tech. Um, unless it's licensed to launch and they build it somewhere else, but I don't no, think so. They're all made in America. I mean, it looks just like a, a car deck. Yep. And oh. guys like guy looked at the guy said, "No, he's like eleven forty. Go for it to twenty. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thinking well, maybe 20, I should 10. buy these and resell them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good chance. Yeah. So, any questions or comments out there about that tool, Locke? No, there's just one about the um, cooling thing. Okay. He said, GM says drinkable water. GM so, says drinkable, drinkable water. water. So that, okay. means, so that means pretty much anything but our sink water. <laughs> Well, I know a lot of the companies definitely say they want distilled the water. Or, or demineralized. Demineralized. Yeah, that's the other one. That's the thing. One or the other. You have, the other. You have a lot of minerals in your water. Yes. Well, I think it enhances it. It enhances it. <laughs> Makes it taste <laughs> better? <laughs> no, it's, but no like if, you're, if you're buying factory antifreeze that's pre-mixed, they're using distilled water. Yeah, or demineralized. Yeah, one or the other. Right. But you know the thing is, it, I always felt that I was getting ripped off when I bought the... Because you, you, you pay, pay for, for a full bottle, but I pay for half water. Yeah. yeah. You gotta so buy it. I'd more. rather just buy a case of water in That's what I Walmart do. or wherever yeah. you're going to buy it. Yeah. You know, I had a Crystal Rock machine, and I'd buy cases of distilled water. That's all I did. The guy yeah, came in, and I would buy... That's a smart idea. Yeah, they all do The guy was already there, and and so, you know, give me a couple of cases, whatever it was, you know, a few yeah. cases. That's a good idea. Yeah. Can you buy it by five gallon gun at this store? No, they only had it in cases of one gallon. Yeah, at least yeah. then. What's well, distilled really made for? For irons? I mean, like, you can't drink Anything, it. Anything, yeah, yeah. Sure you can drink it. Yeah, it's just boiled out. There's no minerals. But, no, I mean, isn't it actually, it would be too much water. It? Too much water? When yeah. I was in science. You're 90% like, water. You were like, well, you want less? But distilled, it's like 99.97% yeah. water. While let's say <laughs> at, at the cellular level, it's like 98.9%. It doesn't matter. It's still water. So you could drink it. Sure. Okay. okay, let's switch down to the distilled water. It's a new water. topic. Yes. Uh, Alan, we want some of your input there. So, Nock, look for Alan's input. I'm going to speak about cars down in New Orleans. Um, there were some. Do they take oh, their tops off? <laughs> cars uh, is something that goes through ASA. It was with their Nate show, that's the auto body show. Got to tell you, if you're an auto body guy, that is the training to go to. Mm -hmm. As far as they had a good number of their people out on the um, technician side, I was disappointed having taught for cars many times years back in um, Las Vegas. We used to get a bunch of people out. The classes were jammed. And now, I think the best class, Dave DeCourcy, 
one of our liar. TST members and one of our TST instructors. Uh, Davy Boy uh, really did a, a bang up job in teaching his class, part one and part two. Um, he did a good job and only had, I'd say about 20, 21 people I counted at best. Now with 21 people, many of these were CarQuest instructors that were down there because CarQuest is a big supporter of cars and it's very nice of them. They do this with other automotive shows as well. Um, I was surprised there wasn't more technicians. You're not far from Texas being in New Orleans. You know, you're not far from Florida. Those are big states that you can get, at least populated states, yeah. um, to get more people out and into a class. It's the economy, you know. It's a lot of money. If you're Florida, it's a flight or you're taking time drive, off from work. Yeah, a long and, you know, it's just not the money out there that used to be. It's, it's even worse now than it was a few years ago. Yeah. A guy was telling me today, one of our TSD members from Florida, he drove from Georgia to go into uh, Tampa, Florida Four for a class, guys, yeah. and it was a Whirlpack class. Mm -hmm. Four guys in a class, mm -hmm. wow. two of Four. which were his guys and himself, so there's only one guy from somewhere else. Oh, wow. And Whirlpack does, we must admit. World Bank does a very they good training. They do a great job. They have a lot of good information. So what does this say about our industry? Yeah. I think more and more people are using Google and using the internet to find information out. Yeah, YouTube's got a lot of crazy stuff. And the yeah. problem yeah. with that is yeah. you gotta you gotta have a super filter on because there's a lot of stuff out there that's just plain wrong. Yeah, and yeah. if you don't know something, how do you know if it's really telling you the truth? Yeah, right. Start, you have to start trusting who you're looking at. But even they can make mistakes. Well, I mean, guess this Look. guys, this guys on the internet that let's say do air suspension, like was it 04 E500? Yeah. And like, oh, you know, uh, you could do it without. Like, we saw there's a dealer guy. Now, did no a Euro shop, and they had the dealer tool, and they showed we we dropped the whole rear end, we dropped all the exhaust, the 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 bags are right there for the taking. Yeah. And then they fill the air back up when the car is in the air because those bags tend to pinch internally. So that guy looks like he knew what he, doing, he was doing. He had a shop and everything, right? Right. Now you can go to Mercedes Enthusiast Forum and they go, hey man, I just did my own air suspension, saved the crap load of money. Yeah. I didn't even use the tool. I just turned the keys and bags filled themselves up. And the problem is if you use the internet as a resource and you're not discerning, you can get screwed. You just bought a $1,600 Bilstein air suspension, you know, air springs, and now it's broken. Yeah, well, right. You gotta know what you'll say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you this. Here's the other problem. I sat in a class recently, okay, and there was an instructor, and I was sitting near another instructor. I should say that first. But the instructor teaching was actually giving out some wrong information, hmm. and unfortunately, the guys in the class were sucking this stuff up. Where I had to interrupt the guy. Because he was saying put low resistance injectors in the place of a high one. So I said, Oops. I said, let me understand this correctly. Smoke time. So yeah. if I have a 13 mm -hmm. to 15 ohm resistor injector, which is common, right? right? Mm -hmm. It pulls approximately on a saturated drive about one amp. If I replace that and put in a low resistance injector, half an ohm, one ohm, four ohms, you're telling me that <laughs> nothing's going to happen to the computer. He said, absolutely not. I said that's that's electrically impossible. Right. Low yeah. resistance equals well, high. Four amp. times the current draw of what that circuit was designed so then, to take. And everyone was listening to the guy with real close writing notes down. After that, and I don't want to break the guy's noodles, right. but I don't like people getting the wrong info. Right. After that, guys started asking questions. Because right. I said, look, electrically that don't work. So other stuff he was coming out with, boom, they were hitting with a question. Another right. question. Right. Because some people read shit on the internet, and this is where I think this guy got some info from. You know, they'll go to IATN forums, they'll go to whatever, and some people make classes or articles out of it. And like I said, yeah. there's good stuff. IATN has a lot of good stuff, same with Identifix. Real but fun. if you didn't work on the car and you're coming up with a bunch of crap and you That's don't trouble. know really what you're saying, this can influence all of us to go, hey, this guy's a great instructor. And we and yeah, make mistakes. By the way, make you have some aftermarket thing that you used to put in for bad drivers? That would work in a case like that, right? Wasn't there something that yeah, could handle yeah. higher loads? Yeah, but it, it only handles up to, uh, 
Most drivers will handle one amp. One amp right. right. This only handles two. Oh, or so two, it still wouldn't handle the four amp. Right. Uh, oh, four yeah, ohm. Uh, well, it's just a bad right. thing to do. Not on only motor that. swaps. Absolutely. On Hondas, Mitsubishi's, Chrysler, Fords. You gotta be careful. And they had the two different injectors and different motors right, right. with different computers and stuff. <laughs> you burnt those computers out. Right. I've seen it many times. Is the peak amperage of an injector though? Much higher than 1.2 amps. But if you have a four ohm injector, it's absolutely. Yeah, well, yes. yeah. so if it's if it's a, a driver made for that injector, and that is momentarily. Yes. Yeah, so, so in a less than right. two less than a millisecond, it'll actually right. do it. So maybe okay. you could get lucky, in a way, because it's the lower resistance one is going to be. It won't. Happen. You're never getting lucky. Not on that. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, you will it's burn cause it a problem. And it probably won't be before like. Very, you know, like a week or two. Because I know he like he walked to a shop in New Jersey, you know, a week before, and he saw guys do it, and they got away with it, and that's how he got the idea, you know. Wow. That's, New Jersey's got a lot of green I stuff. tell you, you gotta the only way they got away with it was because <laughs> they had a voltage drop on the feed side. They didn't have <laughs> yeah, enough right. voltage to start with. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they got away with it because they had two problems. <laughs> when, when, we, <laughs> when we go back to the old days of click, 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 here in the carburetors, click the CCC systems, uh, General Motors learned a big lesson with stuff like that. The low resistance from those solenoids that they had making that go up and down into the jets, that's what really was burning out their computers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nothing has really changed because they do limit those drivers. You know, we're not talking about a diesel. Diesel is very different. Mm -hmm. When you see, you know, danger 120 volts or 100 volts, whatever, that computer is totally different. Direct injection, a little bit different. Okay, mm -hmm. but we're talking the majority of cars that this guy was going on. And that's not the only thing that I've heard. I've, I'm mm -hmm. sure we've all sat in classes and said, did that guy say it? Oh, sure. And I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. Sometimes I catch it and go, oh, the, the mouth engaged before the brain. Especially if he hasn't slept mistake. in three weeks. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, that will be something that is, you know, and I like when people say, hey, you sure? Question. Right, yeah, you have to think about yeah, it. You, think about it. Yeah. you know, one of the most common things, and I've seen this on IATN in a lot of places, and Rich, I'm sure, hears it every day. People get their Ohm's Law backwards. Oh, sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they think a short circuit is a broken wire, or a broken wire is a short circuit, or that, you know, the bottom line is low ohms, low resistance, a direct connection is high current draw. Right. Simply put. Absolutely. And high resistance is, or poor connections, poor connections or corrosion. Is a is a lower current draw. It's a high resistance and a lower current draw. Voltage draw. It's blowing a fuse. It's high current draw. It's a short. It's no voltage drop at that point. It's, short no it's a short, short circuit. Short right. circuit. Right. Okay. With that in mind, uh, let us remind you to go to YouTube and type in TST seminars and type in voltage drop. You can see that, or uh, PCM we inputs and it, outputs right? to see the complete videos we've done on that to help you out. They're absolutely free. Um, we will be throwing some new short clips up, Rich, the ones we did. Right. Uh, they're not compatible with YouTube, so we've got to read them. Okay. We have to do some new ones. So we've got to do new okay. ones. <laughs> so YouTube.com slash TST Seminars. Yep. Uh, Not any other comments or questions? Anything there from Alan? Not from Alan. All right. From anyone? Alan, stop ignoring us. Hey, Alan, are you sleeping on me? Maybe he's fishing. You sure he's there? <laughs> he's on the boat. Um, there are quite a number. A number of them. Okay. Shoot them out. <laughs> you need Craig to get up there? Well, I don't know. One person asked if anyone ran into multiple head gasket failure on Chevy Venture. Mini Venture. I remember them. Oh, is that that Pontiac that's the, that's, that's the 3.8 motor. Uh, very common. No, no, it's thirty-one. So multiple it's failures. 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 yeah, it's a thirty-four. Yeah, thirty-one and thirty-four. Yeah. Mul multiple failures. Uh, Don't mix the lifters. Yeah, make sure you keep them. In the you mean the same the, the same truck. gaskets truck. going truck. bad on the yeah. same engine over and over again? Is that what they mean, or do they mean just they a mean common failure? Head gasket failure. Yeah, head gasket. Yeah, head gasket. Multiple. Yeah, head gasket. Yeah, head gasket. Yeah, head gasket. Multiple. Does that mean many cars, or does that mean on the same vehicle? Let them type that back in. Go to the next question. Yeah, let me clarify that. He just wants to make sure if they go bad a lot. Cause oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> well, I think he said he <laughs> All right. the same Second one is just a comment. He okay. said he has a maxi dust from Autel, mm -hmm. and he likes it. He thinks it's a good product for the money. 
for sure. He also okay. has a BDM OTTO test and old MT2500. Oh, the brick. Okay. The, the brick. brick. The brick. The, okay, so he likes his hotel. That's good to hear. That also like that. comes with the new uh, okay. GPMS tool where pretty much you use the Autel to, like on the Asian cars, we got to plug in, do all that stuff. Yeah. And you can use the TPMS tool to read the radio frequencies and whatnot. Mm. And uh, they're building it where you could use that in place of the bar tech or something. So. Yeah, we'll That's hear great. more from Gary DeLuca, who's the U.S. Uh, the, um, sales head here, um, not far from us here in New York. So we'll try to interview Gary. I'm sure he'll be more than willing to do that. When we do the BMW scan tool shootout, I guess we'll have yours here, right? So we'll. we'll Any other questions? Not just keep reading them because we want to get there. Um, I don't know if it's a. Uh, he uh, just. Uh, skip it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if someone curses at us, we gotta skip it. No. <laughs> Not saying you guys did. Uh, yeah. Well, the other guy said Chevy Venture multiple failure on same vehicle. He was well, fine. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, same so vehicle. same vehicle, multiple failure, you know, is he missing something? Is so the head, using the warp in the head? The head, warp in the head? Uh, did he take a straight edge on the block? And, 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 uh, and, where you the, and where are you getting the gasket from, too? Uh, I used to love like or a Felpro good gasket. Yeah. Either that yeah. or maybe one of the Felpro. water jacket plugs is, is <laughs> something oh, yeah. clogged, it's clogged or something. Water line. In a water yeah. jacket or something like that. Bad water pump. Yeah, it sounds like something else is coming. Or how about if the bolts are stretched and he's not getting a good torque on that, that too. I used to lock tight every bolt. That it's like from the factory. Yeah, the head bolts be, uh, being reused. Yeah, they don't, they don't use yeah. bolts. They don't use torque to yield on those. With the previous shot to see scotch right. Yes. Yes. Now, by the way, <laughs> using the little whizzer wheel, that's a big problem. No, no. You won't no, even no. know you took something off that surface, yeah. and that head gasket is not every, going to go. By the way, every manufacturer at this point says don't use any of those abrasive products when you're doing these surfaces for two reasons. One is what he just talked about, which is making imperfections you don't even know you made, can't so it tell. can't seal. Right. And secondly, they leave pieces in the motor. And if it ends up in the cooling system, it's probably not as bad as if it ends up in the lubrication system. Mm -hmm. A little grindy grind? Oh, well, cut it up. You're also talking expansion rate differences, so it will like to scrub the gasket apart. Right. You hey, you know, that reminds me of this one thing that Alex just helped me on a big time. On my Jeep with a, uh, oh. a 3.7, oh. <laughs> I'm driving, and all of a sudden the vehicle kind of goes like this and dies on me. I bring it back, I'm like, I put the scan tool in, it won't start now because it died on me, but I got it started. I see you got no RPMs, it wouldn't start again. So that crank sets it. So Alex goes through, goes, oh, I'll do it, no problem. Well, he should have never said that. <laughs> because this is the biggest thing. It always problem. goes wrong with family. <laughs> never, never say no problem. Unbelievable. If that, if that would have been more down that tow ring, right. I'll, be, I'll be screwed, I'll be in big problems. Yeah. I miss that thing by... Just but we should tell everyone what we're talking about. Yeah. First of all, the crank sensor, it's a whole effect sensor that goes in through the right side of the block. The tone ring is there, meaning the big flux plate flywheel. Well, it, the bolt came out easy enough. The plastic must have had a crack in it, and when Alex took it out, well, only part of it came out. So now Alex took the metal out carefully. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of room to work on this thing. Right. He's taking some of the plastic out, one piece goes right in the oil pan. Mm. So, Alex's doing the right thing. Now, many people would leave the plastic in there. Oh, there's a period of time we're considering it. <laughs> 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 After all, it's only <laughs> <laughs> no, like, not the right thing to do. We're glad they didn't screw that over on this job. <laughs> um, but uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up, Alex had it all the way out. He gets the new sensor from the dealer. Could not put it in. Couldn't even go the other way. There was rust yeah. <coughs> in the lip. So I'm talking about this with Rick O'Neill, one of our TSD members up in Massachusetts. And Rick goes, oh, yeah, I come across that quite a bit. I had never, ever, I asked you, yeah. seen a crank sensor in a block have a burr like that. Now, I've ABS, oil oil yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, this is an oil. oil. This you is wouldn't an expect oil. it to rust. Right, right. It rusted where he had a you really good trouble in there. Right? Yeah, I, you it out. And, uh, I was thinking after I did that job, and I didn't bring this up to anybody just now. Um, 
can that rust built in that crank, uh, crank sensor, can that make different, uh, pick up a different signal because the rust pushes yes, the sensor out? It can actually destroy Very the possible. sensor too. And I think yeah, they right. have been, it destroy the sensor. I think what it did, there may have been a little lip underneath yes. it, it may have cracked the sensor. It was Sometimes it had rough running and it was weird stuff going on. And right now it runs phenomenal. Okay, So that sensor definitely had some effect on how it was running, but it lab scoped perfect, no DTCs, yeah. everything was cool until it died. So just a little tidbit of information mm -hmm. out there. That's well, a whole effect. Yeah. So that's that's a whole effect. Yeah. So that's all the holes yeah. are yeah. sensitive. Oh. Well, it still works off yeah. a magnet yeah. replacement yeah. pan. Right. <laughs> right. That's 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 I knew we were going on that right. one. Let me see. Knock anything? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he said, I use a, wild, a white flat file, slightly dragging it until surface is clean or completely flat without removing any metal and not scratching on block surface. And these are going to machine Ooh. shop and they need... File? The file's going to remove it. Mm. Oh, yeah, I would rough. think, you know, they tell you like a razor blade. I yeah. mean, I'd always have a scraper. A scraper, a good scraper. You know, and the razor blade would do the fine stuff, you know, where yeah, I can right. go like this right. with the blade. Right. right. But the scraper would be something I always had in my yeah. box. Yeah. Depending, yeah. On, yeah. depending on the gasket yeah. material, some of those products that melt the gasket, are, you got to be very careful with these things. Wear a full face mask, not just goggles. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wear gloves. I like nitrile. I don't think the latex are strong enough to resist this stuff. It's nasty. <laughs> But it, and it doesn't melt every type of gasket, but it softens them up. So when you hit it with the razor blade, instead of that hard chore, it just is like goo. Yeah. Um, I okay. forget who makes the, it. The remover yeah. stuff. Yeah. The remover stuff. Yeah. You know, Permatex, yeah, Permatex or whoever Permatex makes, that. makes it. Yeah, I'd always keep a can of that. But you have to be stuff. very careful about your safety with this stuff because it's a nasty chemical, whatever it is. And that brings me up to safety clean. Just going over a couple of things using safety clean. I had a guy, may rest in peace, that used to work for me, would always clean his hands, and this guy would go nuts, clean his arms with safety clean. Washed himself. He winded it. up getting big cracks, and because I used to teach for safety clean, you know, I used to do material safety data stuff for them, I learned a lot that this stuff was pretty dangerous. In fact, to the point, just the vapors alone ate away two alarm boxes on me. It actually... The alarm would go off in the middle of the night. The alarm guy came and goes, what the hell are you doing? No liquid ever hit it. It was the vapors. The vapors. You read the fine print so that even said. that crap in? Breathe it <laughs> in. It says it doesn't know the psychological effects. It's not a good idea to blow it when we clean bearings out. Yeah. You know, without spinning them, obviously. That's my excuse for To blow my that stuff in there, yeah. open the door up. <laughs> and not good to let it go into your skin. Mm. Wear, don't wear the gloves he's talking about. No, 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 you have you to have wear real heavy ones. Now. Heavy gloves mm. and um, be very careful around the chemicals those, we work Those safety clean freezing. gloves that are okay. black yeah. that are super heavy. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It, this explains a lot of things about all of us right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I learned yeah. a lot. I always had, I had glasses <laughs> for my guys, a right. whole heavy, uh, like a smock thing that would go over, and Craig has it here. Okay, I don't see these guys wear it, but <laughs> they have it here. And the gloves, because guess what? My hand never goes in that crap anymore. Yeah. This guy was 40 years old when he mm -hmm. died. Wow. Died of cancer. Died. died of cancer, and he had cracks. You know, our hands all get these cracks, yeah. but I mean, he had cracks yeah. bad because he just dried it out and it went into his liver wow. and stuff. And he wow. worked to death. So, yeah. unfortunately, wow. you know, safety. Break clean. Look at the stuff guys do. You're not well, a I mean, wimp for I using get a headache from break clean. stuff. Yeah. yeah. To be honest with you, because for years using break clean, mm -hmm. you breathe the crap in, yeah. you start getting a sensitivity towards it. That's right. Yeah. So be careful with chemicals, just all that we're chemicals. on we're all over the place. Right? I think mean, you gotta save the brain cells for drug use. That's right. <laughs> Craig, that's not professional. <laughs> okay, knock, any questions? No. No. Okay. So let's move on to uh, Eric with direct injection and deposits. Uh, I've been working on quite a few euros in the past. I mean, that's the name of my business, Euro Auto. But anyway, uh, free plug. Direct, direct, <laughs> direct <laughs> injection. Direct injection has come, been a lot around for a while now, and starting to hit this hitter base. I've seen multiple cars with major, major build up back and intake valves. And as you know, direct injection, the injector is not behind the valve anymore to, to semi clean it with the fuel they're using, just, you know, uh, premium fuel to, to spray your back injector, you <coughs> back the valve anymore. So, what's happening is the PCV oil is getting in the back of these valves, and when you let it sit and soak overnight, or when you shut it off, it actually builds up this film 
over the top of these valves, so bad that you can't even see through the valve anymore. So I've had many cars come in with multiple misfire counts, and you, you go back to your initial diagnosis, and is it the injector, is it the, is it the uh, ignition system, blah, blah, blah. But I'll tell you what, first thing you look at any direct injection I've noticed so far, is look at your misfires, what cylinders they are, and uh, first thing to do is to try and clean the, um, actually you can actually physically see the valve by taking very small parts off and look it down the hole. A bore scope is the best thing to use. It's amazing, 50,000 miles, how bad these things are getting coked up. Actually you Google it and read about a lot of these problems are happening. Well, some of them matter less than 50,000. Yeah, yeah exactly. 30 something. Like 30, 30 and, and even earlier than so, that. I mean, think about that when you're bringing a car and you're having some misfire issues in your zone. It's only got 30,000 miles on it. First thing you'll say is, is it direct injection or not? Is in my world, uh, what I've seen out there. Uh, way to clean it, I've tried everything. I've tried using BG, I've tried using even Run Right, I've tried using uh, Seafoam. Uh, you, you, Put it through the PC valve so it's, because you can't do it in injectors obviously anymore. And drill, even the mist it in, it's hard. So you, you do it through the PCV hose and you back feed it through there. I've tried five, six times on vehicles. It, it's just not good enough to get them, get them clean. You actually literally got to get the intake up a little bit, close the valves, soak them overnight. They make a kit, you could actually uh, scrub the back of the valves off. BG. The, the BG kit, right? Yeah, which is no more than looks like chopsticks, small chopsticks, and uh, that's where I got and uh, cotton cotton swaps. Uh, and so how are you doing this? We're moving what? Make the the intake manifold. Yeah. Intake manifold. Close the valves off. You do a certain amount, amount of valves at a time. You let them soak for a period amount of time. I let them sit overnight. I've actually used carbon cleaner. Put it right down the valves. Right down the intake. You soak it. Fill it right to the top. So you have a leak down issue with your valves and uh, and clean them that way. And you get 100% Yeah, but you wonder what that does wow. to the seals after a while. Um, I haven't had a problem yet. I've done it to probably five, six, car, yeah. seven cars well, so far. We were doing a lot of them at Volkswagen. By the way, we had to change quite a few intake manifolds because the variable runner flappers would, yeah, also, would also be coked up, but they, it would snap the rod in the middle and you'd have any number of you one to three of them that were... You, you had know, that. It was, you know, <laughs> half of them were working and half of them weren't or whatever. They were broken. Um, and uh, we found that um, we were using a, uh, which worked very well, a Mopar intake cleaner spray and um, Tick run. Uh, wooden, no, 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 but this was, for an in, this was a different stuff. It was a foamy, it was probably like sea foam. Yeah. And um, it was a Mopar part number. And... Uh, we were using uh, like those, uh, we buy them in boxes, those wooden um, like popsicle sticks. Yeah, exactly. And, you, and this stuff is not hard like a deposit uh, from the old fashioned gasoline with old regular injectors. This is hard. It's, it's, it's spongy, soft, gooey, nasty, yeah. gooey stuff. So it's very it's hard to get stuff. out. So when you're looking at mist, when you're seeing misfires, it's usually when they're cold because it's absorbing. Well, it's a air, sponge. Yeah, it's actually, yeah. you're getting too much yeah. fuel to air because you're actually taking away air to the motor. It's just probably is, there yeah. there yeah. 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 is there a way to preemptively stop this? Like, have you experimented Dude, you gotta with that? you got to clean it. That's the only preventive. Or, 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 or oil. The quality of oil you're putting into the vehicle. Very important. Because the and quality of oil is, is a cleaner as well. They put cleaners in the oil. And your PCV system. Yes. And PCV. But the other thing is, uh, when I, and I haven't been so there in a while now. you take every 15 towel? 20. One of our last com one of my last conversations with one of the tech reps from Volkswagen was they were changing the way they were going to do the PCV system and they were going to put a very active uh, cyclone filter in the PCV system to get everything particulate vapor and everything out of the air that went through the PCV. Yeah. Only air was supposed to go through and it was supposed to return it all to the oil pan. But I don't. I don't think they actually had it in production. No, yet. I've actually oh. seen when I pull these PCB hoses off, so the, the mist level. that comes out of that hose is unreal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fog. Well, you know, you ever look inside even a regular gasoline, uh, regular injection motor or carbureted, the amount of hydrocarbon vapors that float around and the mist from the oil and stuff, and this is what makes tons of carbon deposits. Yeah. So now with direct injection, 
you got a worse problem. There's yeah. nothing going washing. Going the higher right. pressures, nothing washing the valves down. Not only, not only it's that. Doing this, it's floating like Christmas time yeah. all over the valves. Yeah. Not only yeah. that, you also have your EGR flow coming through there. By cooking it a little cooking bit. Cooking it, absolutely. Yeah. Raises the heat big time. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Nothing Make like it. taking a little torch to it. That's it. We have one of our uh, students uh, or members, Bruno Parada, who I don't know if Bruno's on tonight, but Bruno has a good story he's going to be giving us in our TST column. Uh, he has a Mercedes Benz that the EGR system was super clogged up. And one of the ways to clean an EGR system, obviously, is with the BG run right or you know, uh, um, winds, whatever cleaning you think works good, and the motor should be hot to do it. Mm -hmm. It takes multiple times to clean these out. Mm -hmm. It's not always people take the valve off and they go, oh yeah, it's going to be stuck here, or they think it's clear. It's down under the passages like Honda's, real bad, right? Well, some of the things that work well, and you know, no one wants to put this in print, although this was in Motor Magazine years back as well, is taking a torch to the carbon. And if you heat the carbon up, and you got to be real careful, obviously, you should have checked under the hood of the car for any hydrocarbon vapors, because it's a real bomb that could happen, right? Don't wash it with yeah. gasoline first. No. Not a good idea. <laughs> but once you heat carbon up, if you're real good with a torch and it's safe under there to do it, again, precautions big time. You heat it up, once it gets hot, you shut off the acetylene, just leave the oxygen, you will hear a big <clears throat> and it'll blow out all the EGR carbon in the passages. It's burning it. So Bruno started to do this, but he was getting a little nervous because I scared him. Mm. I said, Bruno, look, you know, under a Mercedes, it's a little tight under there. It's not like some of the Hondas and some of the GMs, they're right up top, there's a lot of air, and there's, you, you know, you can actually see where you got your torch. Mm. I said, I'd be super careful so nothing happens. Bruno came up with something to save his customer big money and still allow the EGR system to work and keeps the light off. So he's be, he'll be writing an article on this. And again, any of you guys, you know, there's, there's tips out there that technicians have helped make tools, help things with cars. Remember the old heater cores that would take you, God knows how long, I'm talking way back in the 60s where you had to take the fenders off, you had to do a whole bunch of stuff, but if you were smart, you made yourself a little trap door, right? You went in there, you took the whole heater core out, then you just pop ribbon to the thing back, sprayed the, the undercoating under there, and you were done. It saved a lot of time. Blower the customer motors. didn't know any oh, better. Yeah. Heat of cores, blow motors, they weren't accessible, right? That's right, that's right. And how about Fuel pumps on the old trans? How about the <laughs> spark plugs? In the back. Spark on, plugs that you bit. couldn't get out because the fenders were there and the engine was in with a shoe on. We had a whole bunch of different tools we'd make. There was an old Porsche 914 6, you had to drop the motor out of it to change the spark plugs. Remember that car? Yeah. And how about direct injection back then, mechanical direct injection? Um, or mechanical injection, not direct injection, that so many injectors wouldn't come out on the Volkswagens, the Audis, the Mercedes, even the metal tool they gave you to pull them out. Remember those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get some out. You had to use the slide hammer right. to pop them out. So those were money makers. Those were money. <laughs> those were money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of money. A lot of money. Okay. Bring them out there. But anyway, <laughs> let's see what you have to say, and uh, we'll go on for another ten minutes or so, and then we'll call it a wrap for tonight. So, not do we have any other comments? I have one question. Does that apply to Audis as well? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Audi, Volkswagen. Same technology, same really. Uh, Ford, 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 Ford unit Focus is using them. There's a lot, multiple cars that are using them. Yeah, the Recreation, my, my Cadillac has it, my CTS has yeah, it. Almost everything else is coming. Little by little, all the manufacturers are going to direct injection because it allows them to run. Leaner mixtures and uh, pressure, and, yeah. and a very high pressure. The atomization is better. They get better fuel mileage. Yeah. Um, it, it's a more expensive system to manufacture, but it, well, you know, it gets them down the road with, with the EPA. What's and what's the target mileage in like eight years that they want? It's like some fifty something miles. And that's the that. average for a whole fleet, right? Yes, the that is the cafe. Yeah. The corporate average fuel and economy is. Bernie, if you want to get into rocket science, Bernie was telling me. I don't remember when it was we were talking. Well, that's definitely rocket science, my buddy Bernie. That they're now going to have soon so in your bay homogeneous charge engines that turn off the spark plugs at cruise and use compression ignition at extremely lean, and we're talking 22 to 1 ratio gasoline engines, Engines, mm -hmm. 22 to 1 air fuel ratio. And if you make it lean, it makes it hot, so it'll ignite, won't it? Exactly, but it, it's the, 
design of the injectors, the design of the combustion chambers, the design of everything that allows them. They're actually running. Uh, for some knocks. reason, they've they've controlled knocks yes. somehow. No, well, first Bigger of all, knocks, yeah, your you. air fuel ratio sensors so are running twenty something to one already. Right. Where seventeen to one is where knocks forms. Right. But they can control it because the computers and the injectors react so quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. You can get it under control. Hondo is the first one out with that. But homogenous charge. So now you're going to have cars that deliberately turn off their ignition system under some circumstance. So you. So we'll never get tune-ups ever again. You have to re up <laughs> because if, if you scope that ignition and oh, you see man. it's going offline and the car's still running, <coughs> that doesn't necessarily, it's not going to necessarily it's mean a problem. it's a problem. But Pierre, isn't this, you know, when you talk about future tech stuff, yeah. look, look what we have with clutch type alternators. Sure. There you go. You know, right? they're, they're doing all the stuff, they're cutting things out for, for efficiency. Their, for efficiency. It's all miles per gallon. Yes. Right. Cut the alternator out a little bit. Well, yeah. we save some gas. Cut the air conditioning. Go to scroll type. Yeah. We save more fuel. Everything is about fuel saving. Yes. And you're going to see more and more of these gas saving tips because just think about it, even a diesel engine is still only 30 to 35 percent efficient. That means you're wasting a hell of a lot of energy out of that fuel. And gasoline. Yeah. It's only 25 to maybe 30. Mm -hmm. But we keep moving up the efficiency ladder where I don't think gasoline engines are going to go away. And a good place to go is go to SAE.org, SocietyAutomotiveEngineers.org. Head out to lovely Detroit. And those Detroit Tigers beat yeah, our, they beat our Yankees, Yankees tonight. But anyway, <laughs> so head out to Detroit in April to the SAE Congress, and you can learn way more about future stuff that's going to affect you on these cars. Direct injection we looked at years ago. The the next thing that's finally hitting the road, BMW had one of these cars out probably 15 years ago, no camshaft. You're going to go through all valves that are electrically controlled, especially now that battery technology is so much better. And by the way, another company just went bankrupt with government funds, A123, which was uh, which is out of Massachusetts. It was a battery manufacturer, right? Bat Lithium ion batteries. Oh boy, yeah. they were big. A one two three had big bankrupt? had big investors. They're in bankruptcy right now. Big what? investors hmm. like GE, government. Uh, President Obama gave them some big money, as well as some of the other ones uh, that were out there. But these guys went bankrupt. They were going to be sold to a Chinese company. All that technology would have gone over to China until some uh, congressman. Uh, I believe Republicans, not to be political, but this is what I read in the paper, uh, some congressmen and maybe a couple of senators as well, and I'm sure there was a couple of smart Democrats in there, said we are not taking government funded stuff and selling it over there. Because battery technology no, like this is, technology. is <laughs> <laughs> correct. Battery technology like A123, uh, Johnson Controls is going to buy it up, and Johnson Controls is an American company that uh, hopefully this technology uh, will be around. The problem is why they went bankrupt. And in all fairness, you know, even though it was government loans, they thought electric cars were really going to take a big hit. People are still leery. You know, you get into a, a Nissan Leaf that I drove many times. There's no way in hell you're going to get 100 miles on one electric charge. There's no gas engine. Yeah. GM is coming out with their little Sonic, I think it's called, which A123 batteries blew up and some people got hurt. That was another problem. Because lithium batteries, just like the Sony laptop batteries that went on fire and blew up, the technology is still in its, in its infancy compared to where they'll be five years from now. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I have a Chevy Volt that has a gas engine and this 600 pound lithium ion battery and it gets 127 miles a gallon. It keeps growing every time he talks about it. It's on my phone. <laughs> it's on my phone. It keeps I got growing. Growing. But speaking about scary technology that's going to take us out of business, um, I just read a, pl a press release that for police cars, for uh, police Harleys, police, you know, Crown Vex and stuff, Ambulance. lifetime rotors where they make a thin layer of metal that's on the outside that's so hard mm -hmm. that under no no extreme temperature where it's going to wear. Hmm. That you'll never have to replace the motor. And then how are they going to stop the car? 
No, they're just saying it's hard. They're not changing the surface characteristics of the robot. Yes, so the pad would wear. Now, but the part that scares me is so they can slap and drive. <laughs> but maybe. But no. See that, Craig? 127 miles a gallon. Oh, well, you ain't lying. Go. No, you ain't lying. It's right there on the phone. Right yeah. on my phone. Now, anyhow, <laughs> I noticed sense. that the OE brake pads, like you know, we had was it a 2011 Toyota Ca Camry it had 50,000 miles. The pads were like 50 percent. You know, we had a 2008 Chevy Express. Um, it's rotors warped before the pads are at 60%. Common. But they didn't Common. say those police water rotors wouldn't and warp. They just said they wouldn't wear. <laughs> so, good no. point. <laughs> That's true. That's a good no, point. But, so I'm saying is I think with battery, right. tech, battery technology, we're going to have a lot of general braking, the improvements in brake pad technology and our rotors. Up. We're going to see time where we've seen oil changes go from 3,000 to 15,000. You're going to see brakes go once every 100,000 miles. If you have spark plugs that turn off, tune-ups once every 200,000 miles. It's, it's going to get where a lot of the maintenance we're used to is going to go bye-bye. That's the general trend and that's what they want. They're trying to, first of all, they're trying to reduce their petroleum fo footprint to please the EPA. That's what a lot of these devices and techniques are about. Mm -hmm. They're also trying to make the cars uh, cost less to maintain because that looks better on consumer reports or whatever. It makes them more competitive. But, you know, Pierre, that being said, I just heard a great speech by Steve Hanchu from AAIA. Um, and this was out in New Orleans. And <coughs> Steve basically has been in the industry for years with Napa and AutoZone. He said the aftermarket auto parts, because the country is doing poorly, our economy is not doing well, is actually down. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're on a deep sleep, uh, a slope of decline for auto parts because they're not being changed as much. Why? First of all, the price of gas. You know, here we're four something a gallon. We're not like the, our Jersey friends here in the threes. You know, we're about 420, 425 a gallon. It's a lot of money for gas. And that's the point where it starts to hurt. 355 for a gallon. It starts to hurt people, right? So now you have that. Still cheaper than you, walking. And you have people that are unemployed. So what's happening there? They're not driving as much. Overall miles are down. So what does this mean? When a car comes in, and we were discussing this before we went on camera, when a car comes in, you got that one chance maybe to see this car in six months or a year. This is not the 3,000 mile oil change days anymore. They're 575 and 15,000 like Craig said. Okay, Cadillac was begging me to bring my CTS in because they do all the service for free. It's not free. I, you actually pay for it. Yeah. You don't know you're paying for it. Just like BMW. And the all, price of the car. It's a gimmick. Why? They want to try to get cars back in. You know who pays now, for it? Us. Now that being said, <laughs> seriously. Now that being said, one of the things I gave you the gloom. You know where it's not the doom and it's the money maker is doing the preventative stuff, like Eric said. You got to be cleaning these things. You got to sell your customer in the brake flush. Mm -hmm. Brake fluid is still hydroscopic. These people that never mm -hmm. change the brake fluid because only Very bad. only Honda and maybe BMW and a couple of companies actually recommend it. The rest of them is advisory. You got to sell it. The aftermarket technician now needs to be like the big box store. What do I mean by the big box store? You got to turn into a Sears, a AutoZone, a uh, um, sell parts deal on you. Well, oh, you got to no. you got to you got to sell correct something stupid. You gotta sell services. That's where there's money. Yeah, totally. You gotta look at air filters. You gotta sell them cabin air filters. You gotta sell them things that can and clean it, out the mold in their system. And you gotta free, you gotta look at the car and tell people when things are coming up because people like to be informed about stuff before it kicks them in the butt. Yeah. So and, you're saying if you give them that service, then you become more valuable to them than the other guy. So you're saying print out the 30 to 60 to 90? All of that. That I, was always a money maker. My spiel with my customers was, you know, I was a specialist with my BMW shop. I'd say, this is the schedule according to BMW. They want your car to last six years or 100,000 miles and they want to crush it. This is my <laughs> schedule. I want your car to last hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles, but you're going to have to do these things to make that so. Which one do you want to do? No okay. choice. So I gotta leave. We'll see you next week. Okay. All right, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, Eric. Oh, yeah. uh, Don't forget so your jacket and your you cameras and, and your cameras and stuff. Yeah, so the bottom line is that's the way to sell it. And 
you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I had customers who said, if the light's not on, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> well, I can't win that war. <laughs> and isn't this a problem with these people not changing their oil because they're uh, waiting for the monitor? They're right? waiting for the light, the light to, come to come on. And you know, if it's if it's due, I mean, it's got a few hundred more, a few thousand more. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> and and we saw that at Volkswagen too, by the way. We, uh, I think the record I saw was a was a, uh, a Touareg with twenty six thousand miles since the last oil change. <laughs> Mm. Well, didn't, we, didn't we just have 18,000 uh, miles? Very bad. On a regular <laughs> car in a Dodge Ram. Oh, yeah, Dodge the, Ram. The bottom line is, is engine. those aren't real customers. Like, those are, and it know, lasted that long with the oil in that. And of course, then it blows up and it's very expensive and they cry like it's your problem. Um, <laughs> they don't blow up enough. And the bottom line is, um, the good customers, the ones who want reliability and want to go the distance, will understand that logic. Right. Well, let's finish up with one last thing, and that is the right to repair. How do you feel about it? What happened up in the state of Massachusetts and NASTF National Automotive Task Force? It's not enforceable in Massachusetts. What's the state of Massachusetts going to do to force skating tool companies to... Well, I'm not sure, but when you start else. getting a piece of legislation, first of all, NASTF having served on the board, the head of the training committee, co-chaired it, uh, still involved, I was just asked today, to do more stuff uh, on the, the NASDR board. I believe we have, from the OEs, good information that they provided to us, free if you're Hyundai Kia, very reasonable if you're Toyota and GM and stuff, scan tools that you can purchase, information I can readily get, not only for the emission-related system, but how the law was written, for everything. Mm -hmm. I am just fearful that, you know, States are going to be making a law because technicians out there are not aware of really what they have already. We don't need the government to give us more rules and regulations that only waste money and waste time. They can't run what they have already. Just looking at our, our economy, look at the stupid laws we have. We don't need more laws to keep this thing just perpetuating into more litigation because that's what will happen. What we need is really something that these companies have stepped up to the plate, Toyota being the first one, and give us the information at either a reasonable fee, okay, or free. And I think if we're not careful, and this is everyone's responsibility, to make sure you tell people in your family and stuff, that unlike Massachusetts where all the pot stores came out and manufacturers and said, sign this petition, right to repair is good for you. First of all, what they're doing is taking a company like GM or Toyota or Ford or BMW that spend millions upon millions in research. Billions. Billions, actually. Thank you, Pierre. To develop something, and then they're going to release their blueprints to someone or give the information away for free. That is not a good business model. We couldn't stay in business if we gave our services away for free. Okay? So we need to be... On the the thick and skinny here, and on the same page, and be behind NASTF, and not be behind this right for repair. So if you hear some of that, I notice some noise here in New York State. I'm sure it is in New Jersey and the rest of the country. We need to stay away from that and tell people that we have what we want already. You know, I think I spent 11 years on donating my time and spending my money to go to these meetings. And it's very, very important that you get involved. By the way, and I'd like to add to this, in the early 90s, BMW's president in this country was quoted in a magazine article as saying, quote, we want every dollar that accrues from the sale of our vehicles to go through the franchise system. Sounds an awful lot like monopoly to me. And that meant cutting me out of the loop, putting me out of business. The only thing that turned them around was the threat of the Right to Repair Act, However, here's the problem. Back then, the Right to Repair Act meant selling, not giving away, selling all the technical information at a reasonable price. What this Right to Repair Act, same name, different act, does is it forces the manufacturers, like Jerry said, to release all the technical information to their competition, the other manufacturers, aftermarket. 
it's not going to help us at all. I think these manufacturers, that law only applies to the EPA, to emissions. What's going to happen is all the manufacturers are going to climb into their shells. And we'll get nothing. And we'll get nothing. Think of the days, Pierre, when Cheryl Edelman, yeah. when I first got on the Holly SPS board, and Holly Puglisi got Pierre, okay, so they were, it was the information, they weren't in order, right. but you got the information from BMW, one of the first guys in the country, right. to get that information. Right. Okay. Of course, at first they put it on a CD and they stuck it in a blender first, so you needed to take your whole life to get it. had a whole list of what was on each CD. Some five series okay. here, this year there, but he did it, and, and now it's nice and easy. You yeah. get what we it's all there. And by the way, you know, I don't know about other brands, but you go on a BMW website, they decided it was not worth their money to separate the EPA stuff from everything else, and you go on the website for $30 a day or whatever it is, and you get everything. Everything. It's great. Just like Toyota, you know, GM $55 for three days. How can you go wrong, get the factory scan tool, you use a, a mongoose cable or a, a J-Box from Drew Tech, you hook up to these cars with the scan tool. This is getting better and better, but this is going to stop if the Right to Re Repair Act goes through in more states. This is going to be a major problem. So please read up on it. Get behind NASTF. Go to NASTF.org. You can go to my website, ATTS or TSTSeminars.org, and guess what? You can link right there to NASTF. It's something very, very important. Now, let's see if we have any more questions, and we got like a couple of minutes left. Not really questions. But Comments? Anything? Alan just got to us. Um, he has a long list. Of oh, That's no. my buddy Alan. Craig, get up there and read it. Oh. I just said, Alan, you write us a story every so time. Every professional two right to repair repair acts that have the same name if they're two they, totally it, different it, it morphed. The, uh, it the history there. of that was there was a senator, I forgot his name, from Wisconsin or Minnesota? Yeah, Wisconsin, I think, right? Wisconsin. He, he initiated the original act in the Senate. There was a, some other congressman who had it in, in Congress at the time. Well, he got Wellstone, was that something? It like was Wellstone. Okay. And he got killed in a plane crash during his campaign. And the 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 name of the act kept going but every session they reintroduce a bill they introduce a bill they give it the same name it's not the same wording but now it's being supported by these businesses who right. have their own agenda and it's not our agenda it's against us really well, yeah, against the manufacturers. Like, huh? because it's got the same name it's actually confusing a lot of people absolutely right. and, well, the and thing it is sounds like it's good it. That, but it sounds see, good, a right to repair. I mean, you're right, a right, to, right to repair, right? Exactly. Uh, uh, knowing, that, knowing that there's already the one that we agree with and the one that now we The one that we agree with hasn't been out there well, for remember, a long time. You know, right. it's, so it's that's 11 plus yeah. years ago, we actually had something in our TST newsletter about the right to repair. We thought at the point it was not a bad idea. But that was but the old one. That was, that the, was old the old one, one. And NASTF did not even exist back then. Right. right. So it was a big difference. Craig, you want to get on with Alan's? Yeah, first, uh, Alan is going to be have the last word because he is a movie star now. <laughs> oh, that's right. Alan, <laughs> Alan is on a P10 thing. I congratulated him. Can I have an autograph? He uh, is very famous. <laughs> he's in print, he's on the internet, and he's in a blog type thing. Or, yeah, uh, like a podcast. A podcast, that's what he's doing. He's cool bar. So, Alan, cool you bar. owe me some crawfish and some it. catfish. Yeah. There's some other guy's pictures of his toolbox in some magazine. That's me. He's oh, back. <laughs> so first says, uh, lay off Craig. He's very handsome and nice. <laughs> no, Alan, we know you're lying. Craig's written something new. <laughs> he starts off with this. I purchased the early bird super pass. I attended nine classes for $250. That's a good price. Very good. Which would cost $900. So I paid for each class individually. Dave DeCourcy had a great two-part class on misfires that was very informative. Other classes were on J25 for replashing. I'm sure he meant reflashing. Yes, sure. <laughs> J25, 34. And yeah. new vehicle technology. All the instructors are very good, except one, which I won't mention his name. <laughs> but TST is familiar with him. <laughs> he knows the info, but doesn't know how to present it to the students. I'll tell you later. I'll lie. Yeah. <laughs> one new thing I heard about is tin whiskers. I thought this was a joke, but apparently it is not. It is from solder without lead. Is this becoming a real problem on PC boards? Yes. 
Uh, Pierre says, yeah, so there well, you go. We had a big now. problem on ABS controllers. That was a, part of the reason for all those failures starting early whenever on. they, early on, whenever they got rid of the solder at the beginning, and, and it still continues to a lesser degree today. <clears throat> These whiskers actually seem to grow like magic and cause short circuits. Yeah, they bridge. Um, yeah, they bridge. In the middle of these comments, Simon Montequiza says, back off, New Jersey. <laughs> Watch your money. <laughs> we don't mean buddy here either. <laughs> and uh, Alan continues, the expo had good attendance, but many of the classrooms were less than half full, and some only had 10 people. It's kind of like Connecticut TSD. Uh -huh. <laughs> Most instructors were car quests, and they were very informative. Maybe it was not advertised properly. I only found out because of CarQuest. So CarQuest was the big guys bringing guys out to it. Also, I think there's a headwind there. Cars has been so body industry uh, oriented that it gets dismissed by a lot of people in the re in the you know mechanical repair industry. And the other problem was they cut down uh, quite a few years back a three hour, four hour seminar to one hour, one and a half hour. Wow. What are you gonna learn in one and a half hour? They had a few of them this time as well. One and a half hours ago, didn't they learn anything from the criticism on IATM? What else did he have to say? Uh, and that, that is it. Alan's story ended. Okay. Well, I want to tell everyone uh, thank you. We'll mm -hmm. see you next Thursday night. It seems like we're always doing something. And don't forget our November meeting coming up, uh, the week of the 12th, I think it is. Uh, we'll be up in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. I second think it's the week. I think second week. It starts second. the sixth. I think. No, no, no. no. It's the week after. The, the week I think. After. I think it was yes. the twelfth. It's the second. Uh, the, the second, second one was the full week. Right. <laughs> in uh, whatever that date is. We'll second. all have to go on the website. Monday is Massachusetts. Tuesdays Connecticut. Wednesdays New Jersey. And Thursdays in New York. Right. And all over the world. Thanks and, to on the end. webcast on Thursday. Correct. Simulcast. So thank you for your time. Or guess. By the way, Alan, you may want to check this guy out. Our guest speaker is Peter, Peter Orlando, Orlando, who awesome. does a very good job. By the way, he's from New Jersey, but we don't mind that, Montequiza. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Good night. Right. Good night, guys.